Hey everyone, we left you off on a cliffhanger last time. We talked about Stellar Birth all the way to Red Giant Phase. I can't wait to find out what happens next. So, after it has become its Red Giant and the helium fusion stops, and let's st take this one of two ways. We're going to take this with low mass stars first and then we'll talk about high mass stars. What do you mean by low mass stars? Well, low mass stars are stars that are like the sun. They are not incredibly huge. They are less than four solar masses. And they could be even less than that. They can be less than they that. They could be 8% mm -hmm. the mass of the sun. Sure. So very, very small suns to, like you said, four or five times bigger than our current sun is considered low mass. So we've hit the end of the helium burning phase. Carbon and oxygen are in the core of the sun. What happens now? At this point, you're not going to get as much outward pressure. There's not going to be as much burning. It's a carbon and oxygen burn at a much hotter temperature, so they may not burn at all. So why can't they burn? What's wrong with the star? It's just not hot enough. And why can't it get hotter? Oh, it's a low-mass star. So with a low-mass star, there's not the pressures and temperatures you talked about to fuse carbon and oxygen. That's right. And that's a problem. So what will happen next is that as the star begins to collapse down on itself because the gravity overcomes pressure of fusion, it, the star will start to collapse and leave some of its outer layers behind. And then you'll get nothing left over but the core. So right in these, we call these things planetary nebulas, which is a very confusing name, I know. But what it means is that the outer layers of the star have been fluffed off, shot out into space, and like you said, at the center of each of these pictures, you're gonna see a small white little dot. Mm -hmm. That small dot is what? A white dwarf. A white dwarf. And the white dwarf is really the core of the sun, left over. It's hot, it's extremely hot, but it's really, really tiny. And in the light and energy given off by that core excites the gases that are around it. So white dwarfs, when we talk about size, dwarf kind of tells you the name. It's tiny. It gets to the point where electrons repel each other so much that gravity balances out with that repulsion and we can't have the star collapse any further. It actually collapses down to the size of Earth. Which uh, gives it a pretty high density. Uh, uh, a ton per teaspoon is pretty heavy. So you could pretty much, if you had a teaspoon of a white dwarf, it would be as much as a car. Pretty much. So it's a hot ball of gas, mainly carbon and oxygen, that is just gonna cool off forever. And that's about as far as our sun would go. I don't, it, it won't go any further than this. Uh, it's gonna reach a white dwarf stage and pretty much stay that way until everything burns out, I suppose. And eventually it'll cool, and once it cools and no longer gives off light, in trillions and trillions of years, we'll probably just call it a black dwarf. Probably will. Because it's not giving off any light. So that's the death of low mass stars like the sun. But we got to rewind and talk about stars that are bigger than the sun because there are many stars bigger than the sun. Most stars are bigger than the sun and everything with high mass stars basically happens bigger than with a low mass star. So things much larger than the sun burn hotter which means their cores can be a lot hotter than the sun and helium fusion stopping is not the end of a high mass star. So in a high mass star, the carbon and oxygen in the core can actually fuse. Yes, they can. And so the fusion uh, can continue, and it actually will fuse all the way until you reach iron, which won't fuse. In all the other fusions, we get energy given off every single time, like carbon turning into neon or oxygen turning into silicon and sulfur. All those processes give off energy, but you said iron's the killer. Mm -hmm. Iron absorbs energy when you try to fuse it. And that's a big, big problem. Well, yeah, it's going to lead to the death of the star eventually. Um, but these are going to get very, very big in the process of the fusion up to that point. So instead of them being red giant stars, they are now known as super red giants. Like one we've talked about many, many times, Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is about the size of the orbit of Jupiter around uh, the sun. So it's very, very large uh, because... The fusion process is continuing and continuing with much larger and larger molecules and much more heat, so your out pressure is much greater. So if you plop Betelgeuse in our solar system, the first five planets would be orbiting inside of it. That's right. Not a good time. But like we said, when all of this fusion ends and you have this massive, massive star, you're going to have some issues. The outward pressure stops when the core becomes iron. Mm -hmm. 
So what's left? Well, really, it's just a matter of everything collapsing down onto that center. So what's going to happen is that gravity is going to win out in this case. Uh, there's so much material that it's impossible for the pressure of fusion, which is basically stopped at this point, um, to overcome gravity. Gravity collapses. The entire star collapses down on itself. And there's a massive explosion called a supernova. So in the supernova, you can think of all the material in the star, every element that it's made, being blown out into space. And it looks like we're kind of making a nebula again. Sort of does. So in those gas clouds from supernova explosions, we have hydrogen, we have helium, we have all these elements, and even during the supernova process, we can make heavier elements like gold, uranium, lead. All those heavy, heavy elements are made in the split second it takes the star to blow itself apart. But what happens at the center of this thing? Well, that's what we want to look at next. So if there's any planets in the vicinity of a star that has gone supernova, well, they're in deep trouble. They are. And we have seen supernovas, or hypernovas, in our own sky. If you look on the right here, it's pointing to a star that they observed back in 1987. And on the left is the same star the very next day. Mm -hmm. Supernova event. Um, you can see that anything in the vicinity can, uh, it, well, basically be destroyed. And it's so bright that you actually even see this during the daytime. Mm -hmm. That's how impressive a supernova explosion is. So what's left after these supernova or hypernova events? Well, we've got two possibilities. One possibility is a neutron star. A neutron star is a star that collapses to such a point uh, that protons and electrons are combining to form neutrons. So a proton is positively charged, an electron is negatively charged. If you add a plus one and a minus one, you get a neutral charge. You get no charge. Neutron star. And a neutron star is so dense that it actually collapses to only 10 kilometers across. It's extremely dense. Yeah, that teaspoon that weighs a ton, this is way more. Teaspoons, we're talking thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of tons. So in this case now, because of the intense gravity and the intense size of a neutron star, they have very strong magnetic fields and they spin and rotate very, very quickly. And out of their poles, they send a lot of radio waves. So if we have radio telescopes pointed towards these neutron stars due to the rotation of the neutron star, we can detect a radio signal at a pretty particular rate. Right, so they call these things pulsars because they appear to be pulsing that energy like at a, regular intervals. Just like a lighthouse yeah, spinning very, its light around. Very much. But we're seeing now the radio waves emitted from a neutron star washing over Earth. If the sun is so massive that it can actually overcome the neutron pressure, gravity could make the star collapse and continue to collapse. A lot of times they call this collapsing forever, that they just never stop collapsing. These are called black holes. And the reason they're black is because the gravity is such an intense force that even things traveling light speed can't leave. So how do we even know they're there? Well, we can see things going around them for one thing. We can watch as stars that are close by sort of circle the drain, revolve very quickly around them. And you can see that if it's near a normal star, the black hole can actually pull mass off of the star. And as it, you said, spirals towards the drain of the black hole, those gases heat up and can give off X-ray and gamma ray light. We can also see things called jets, which is energy that's exiting the black hole. It's happening outside the event horizon, which is a strange phenomenon, but um, we can actually see X-ray emanations coming from those. Uh, but the event horizon is kind of the edge of the black hole. Anything that goes beyond this edge must be traveling faster than light to leave. Yeah, that, that is the point of no return. And since traveling faster than light is impossible, yes, you can't leave once you pass the event horizon. So to recap the life cycle of a star, we talked about stars forming in nebulas. Once they make their protostars, their baby stars, they clear out all the gas and dust around them and become main sequence stars. They'll live their life as a main sequence, either hotter or cooler than the sun. And when that's done, they become the red giants. If they're bigger stars, they become super giants. If you're a sun-like star, you puff out your outer layers in planetary nebulas, leave your dead white dwarf cores behind, 
and just cool forever. If you're a massive star, then you expand more to become a super giant. And when you collapse, you can go to a supernova or hypernova event, which uh, basically collapses you into what could be a neutron star or even as uh, massive as a black hole. So now we know how a lot of stars are born, how they live, and how they die. So twinkle, twinkle, little star, we know exactly who you are. Later.